our conversation, I want to take a step back as a group and think about how can we question some of the concepts around higher education that, that we accept, right? So starting up uh, with you, Chin Wei. For you, what is the ultimate goal of higher education? And you know, kind of beyond, you know, finding a job and having success uh, uh, financially, how do we measure its uh, impact? Thank you, Felicia, and good morning, everyone. I'll just start with a simple definition from my understanding. Higher education, the purpose of higher education is social and human development. And the key word there is development and relevance. Um, even though the complex issues that we deal with in the world today are different from when universities were first started, the consistent theme is how is how are the activities in the university impacting the lives of the community around? Um, within Africa, if you look at the early Pan-Africanist fathers, whether they were Francophone or Lusophone or Anglophone, um, people like uh, Lipert, Sada, Senghor, Felix, Fufu, Bogi, Bogi, um, Ahmed Sekuturi, Nambia, Zikiwe, irrespective of their differences and whatever shortcomings they may have, they had one common or a few common purposes. They understood what they were getting the education for. They had a clear sense of purpose, a clear sense of direction, a unanimity um, of why they were in the US or in Britain or in France. Um, and they came back and applied the knowledge that they had to the relevance to the issues in their countries. So I'll stop there. Okay, so uh, Abinawa. How does with all of that, how does that relate uh, to STEAM? Um, I'd also kind of love you to give just a little bit of background around what STEAM is and, and why it's relevant in this conversation. When we think of development, whether social or in terms of human capital development, I think often on the continent, we look at it from the perspective of what the West considers to be development. And I think for better or worse in recent years, when we speak of innovation, a lot of it was in the past focused on STEM. So science, technology, engineering, math, and more recently people have realized that the so-called soft skills are very important as well. So having added the arts to that, which is where we get STEAM from. And while innovation is critically important and it creates all types of opportunities for development, also, understanding the type of innovation that you want to have, the type of development that you want to have, the ways in which you want to do things are very important because if our goal is simply to mimic the West, we will also mimic many of the challenges of the West, whether it's environmental degradation, growing inequality. And so what I'm advocating for is really an Afrocentric approach to development, and I use that word deliberately. I think, unfortunately, when people hear Afrocentric, we think, for better or worse, no offense intended, incense and dashikis, right? Do you guys know those African-American festivals you would go into the US and they'd become a very unfortunate and unfair stereotype? But really the term of Afrocentricity, it's about centering what is important to us, the values that matter to really creating a different type of future on the continent. Not that mimics the East or the West, but that speaks to our own assets and what we view as important, both in terms of human as well as social development. That's great. Um, and so, Chin Wei, uh, is there such a, for you, is there such a core thing as kind of, uh, as core uh, African values? And if so, what are they? And how do they relate to higher education? I know it's a very, very large question. It is a very large <laughs> question, and there is a, a large debate about whether there is a, such a thing as African philosophy or African core values, and what is Africa, and, and who is Africa. But I, I really, my position on the debate is that um, a people develop values based on shared experience, a shared vision of their future, and a shared identity that comes from the past and, and vision of their future. And, and I can only go back to the early Pan-Africanists to, to give examples. So our shared experience of slavery, colonialism, neo-colonialism, all of these things have evolved into what we can call an, an African philosophy. Um, I, I often hear the term Ubuntu being used, and I think that's probably the closest that we've come to uh, articulating a westernized, sanitized version of what an African philosophy means. But, but what does Ubuntu mean, right? So the westernized interpretation of Ubuntu is, I am because we are. We have a shared humanity. 
but the, the, the challenge with that is that the, the original concept of Ubuntu goes much further than that. If you contrast Ubuntu to René Descartes' I think, therefore I am, Ubuntu is not just a philosophy of thought, it's a philosophy of action. It's identifying that I cannot be happy when you're sad. I cannot be content when my brother is hungry. Um, Kwame Nkrumah is, Nkrumah is recorded in 1957 when Ghana gained its independence as saying, Ghana is free and will never be colonized again. But the freedom of Ghana means nothing if the rest of the continent is not free. That is Ubuntu. The idea that we, there's a collective call to action, that it's not sufficient to have a philosophical thought that makes us feel good about each other if we're not taking action to do something about it. So before I move on, does anybody else on, on the panel want to respond to that? I think if I could just add um, to what my colleague said, when we speak of values, when we speak of tradition and things like that, I think unfortunately there is an idea that tradition, culture, values are stagnant, but that's actually not the case. And I think the Ubuntu that you're speaking about is how do we make sure that our values evolve over time to reflect who we are at this particular moment in time. That when we speak about values, it's not about speaking of what was necessarily happening in 1605, but it's speaking about contemporary issues and how we again use our history, our heritage, those endowments that we bring with us into the future to address issues in real time. And that part of what it means to have Ubuntu is to evolve with the times. Uh, so I want to make a little bit of a, of a shift here and then kind of talk about how some of these uh, ideas affect all of us in our everyday lives and also at our respective uh, institutions and in our areas of uh, research. So uh, Dr. Ali Du, uh, given your research on the Sahel, um, what do you think that some of the ways are in which the roles of African women have been misunderstood or have been omitted from history? Um, and how do you understand the consequences in our world right now of, of that omission? Good morning. Uh, thank, thank you very much uh, for uh, this uh, wonderful panel that you, you are moderating, Felicia, and uh, for all the um, esteemed colleagues uh, from uh, on the panel, from our senior uh, minister, uh, Professor Yanka, whose book I use in my classroom. <laughs> so it's a great honor to be here and sitting with you, and to my young uh, uh, colleagues uh, here. Um, so it is interesting that in this panel, we are four African women. And this is uh, really uh, the idea of what it means to have a, uh, not only a hopeful present, but a hopeful future that actually mimic what's in the African epistemologies and also the values of looking at education that does not alienate implies. In African, when I talk about Africa, uh, the African, uh, we are talking about Ubuntu. Uh, in my conception of the Africa, I'm talking about the many Africas, uh, including the diaspora, uh, including the majority of Africans who are operating outside the formal system uh, that we are talking about, uh, who are in the margins of uh, the formal schooling system uh, that shape our Western epistemological conception, even though we are talking about the Africa. So here, most of us here are operating within Western epistemology. And it's very important that when we talk about education, not schooling, that we understand that there are other modes of educational framework, paradigm, that draw from indigenous knowledge system. And African women are very central to this transmission of indigenous epistemologies and indigenous knowledge systems. So I take one example. We are all 
in the 21st century in the digital mode. If you Google Moringa, the Moringa leaves, if you Google bitter leaves, you will see that today, in the 21st century, these are indigenous African plants which have, are growing in the backyard of my grandmother's garden, which African women, as the healers, as food processors, understood, the, the understood and continue to understand the nutritional value of this indigenous plant that we eat, that are part of our rituals, which we will call ethnobotany, etc. But when it is in Western epistemologies, it will just be called botany. Can that knowledge of African women be translated into the reform of the educational system so that we have a conversation between the African women, the majority of them who do not have access yet, who do not have opportunity to be where we are at today. Their knowledge system that are operating, that very often scientific uh, people in the science world will go into the field work and ask questions. They become the informants. And their knowledge of our own mothers, grandmothers, get appropriated, get copyrighted into other world scientific world without giving them credit, without giving African credit. That to me is the major problem in terms of what is the gap in the discussions that we have been having. The knowledge systems that are operating outside the academy, the Western Frame Academy, that need to be integrated, that is located into the, the, the mind, the brain, the intelligence of African women in agriculture. Think about mancala, think about bitter leaf, think about morengati. Every place today, we have morengati, we have moringa, uh, vitamins. We have this. I grew up eating it. You go to every market in West Africa, you will find the, the varieties of Moringa process. This is to me the place where we do not take, for instance, the knowledge system that is there within us, value it. We value it only when it is coming from outside world. And that knowledge system is African. African women, whether in Africa or on the continent, the diaspora, this is some of the knowledge system that people of African descent have brought to the Americas, to the Caribbean, to, uh, to Europe, to, to the Middle East, to other parts of the world, Asia, everywhere we go. You just have to look at, for instance, now the African chefs. We are on, on Google. Just check the best African chefs. Whether you take Pierre Cham in New York, whether you take uh, other African women whose, uh, whose knowledge has not been valued, but who find themselves in this story of old and new contemporary migration, when they open the restaurants, they are part of the iron chefs. Imagine the nutritional value that this migration, not only of the African bodies, but the African knowledge system that find themselves in the kitchen, in the industrial North America. Changing the nutritional system. Egusi sauce. This is the pumpkin that grow, and that is in, again, our grandmother's garden. Peanut sauce. We brought it, we brought peanut, mafe. Today, mafe is making its own way. It's very appreciated. This is the sauce that I grew up eating, that each one of us, you cannot be, even in this restaurant, in this restu restaurant, Radisson Blue, we have mafe sauce. 
right? It has found its ways all over. The African women have processed peanuts, have made it the recipe that today is in part of the Western gastronomy, Asian gastronomy. It is valued somewhere else. It may be patented somewhere else. This is the knowledge of African women. It may be in Pierre Champ's chef recipe, but he honors his grandmothers. He honors his mothers. That is what I call the knowledge system, the dialogue between indigenous African knowledge system that navigates throughout the world. And that is also rooted through the women that need to be acknowledged. So if I go to have a dialogue with my colleagues in food science, with my colleagues in plant biology, with my colleagues in the business world, when they say African women don't have knowledge system, I say think about it. My role is not to come and talk about schooling that alienate us. My role, as we say, the Ubuntu, the African presence in whatever knowledge system, epistemology, whether we are talking about natural sciences, whether we're talking about biology, uh, 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 engineering, whether we're talking about mathematics. Let's take Mankala. How many of us here in this room does not know Mankala? Do you know what Mankala is? The African game system that we play, it has on Google Mankala. You all have cell phones. Google Mankala. <laughs> Professor Yanka, honorable Mrs. here, he has a book, African Folklore. When I go into classes in American public schools to teach about ways in enticing the teachers to show the contribution of Africa to world civilizations from centuries past to the present. In the field of mathematics, before the African child start the formal schooling in Western epistemologies, our grandmothers have taught us how to play Mankala. I hear about pacification of campuses. If you share a meal and you spend time playing game with someone, you play Mankala. The stress gets reduced. The brain gets wired differently. Mankala has helped many African kids and adults and adolescents to bond, to create friendship, brotherhood sisterhood. When our mothers are busy taking care of many of us and cooking for us, when they see children in tension, they ask us to go take the Mankala game and play. We develop mathematical skills. We develop ways to negotiate each other. That's very, it, it affects many fields of knowledge that need to be integrated. Today, when you Google, you will see Mankala and mathematics. This is part of African indigenous system that have traveled throughout the world, and today it's part of the gaming system, even in computer. Take African fractals. The Bogolan, mud cloth that African women where an African man were from Mali. You can imagine it as an indigenous knowledge system about agriculture, transformation of cotton, which we have carried into the new world, in the Americas. African women transform cotton, made textile, this textile in engineering, develop design, geometric designs, 
which in the Western world today, there is a book by our colleague called African Fractals in Mathematics. It can be intuitive knowledge, but it passed on. It is education. We have gone into an education system, schooling system, that is so alienated. And in the post-colonial dispensation, post-independence, we have not rethink, rethought how to integrate indigenous knowledge system to be in conversation with other knowledge system. Mm, right, you know, we so talk about Singapore math. Why not African math? <laughs> so, uh, thank you. I am so sorry to interrupt you, but, I, but one, since I'm wearing mud cloth, I feel like I now have earned the right. Um, and I see that Chin Wei is just itching to respond to everything that you were just saying that was so interesting. Yeah, thank you. You know, yesterday, Madam, when we were discussing, you, you shared an African proverb that kept resonating to me. You said if the, if the lion doesn't speak up, the story of the jungle will always favor the hunter. Um, but then in your comment now, you said that the African indigenous um, knowledge systems need to be acknowledged. Acknowledged by who? Right? We need to tell our own story, and that's the role of African higher education. It's not necessarily that we want to mainstream into Western education, it's that we develop our own and we tell our own stories. So I just wanted to add that. Okay. So that is a, is a perfect point. Um, so, you know, so I want to... I wanted to put it to our, our minister, uh, Kwesi Yanka. What is the role of public universities in promoting African scholarship? You know, we in the education sector have a huge task um, ahead. Um, it's the task of ensuring that we, first of all, believe in ourselves and our knowledge systems and our epistemologies. Um, we ought to start the entire process and ensure that our local voices are heard loud and clear within the global domain. I was interviewing one of the Achiami or linguist spokesmen in African settings. And after a long interview, Ashanti said, you know, all this knowledge that I'm passing on to you, a student, you a student, um, I am giving you the kind of knowledge that you are going to use and write down and get your PhD. When you get your PhD, you then begin looking down on me, who gave you the material out of which. He was saying that he rather deserved the PhD. It is he who is the custodian of the knowledge that I'm pilfering. Virtually. Um, so how do you address this? Um, the, 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 the very nature of the system that denigrates indigenous knowledge and then elevates we the intermediaries. We are intermediaries. We are knowledge brokers. We, we, we mediate. And as a result of this, appropriate to ourselves you know, that we are the, the masters, we are the kings. It is a failure of our own education system that doesn't respect African scholarship. Take a look at many of the slabi of universities throughout Africa. And you may count on your fingers within the bibliographies, the number of authors that are African, and I'm talking about African universities. You can count off on your fingers the number of scholars within our own universities that would cite a colleague's work 
next door, a colleague next door. And the fact that we ourselves subvert ourselves by ensuring that during the promotion process in African universities, the very first exercise on the part of any assessor is to look at your bibliography and see how many Western scholars you have listed. So the beginning of the process of assessing begins with the bibliography. If it's an overwhelming number of Western scholars, yes, you are likely to be promoted. This is the system of ensuring that we do not recognize our own scholars. Someone did a, 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 an exercise, a very casual exercise of just looking at thesis within African universities. And you see, when we don't cite our local scholars, it doesn't mean that they are not working. They are working, but we ourselves know that the tradition is that of citing Western scholars. But part of the reason is also our own. The packaging of local epistemologies and indigenous knowledge. To what extent have universities taken the trouble to give access to the global village? Access in whatever means, by whatever means. Look at what happens with our master's thesis and doctoral dissertations throughout African universities. The master's thesis is written doctoral dissertation entirely locked up, most likely in the office of the head of the department. Western scholars come all over African universities. To many of them, knowledge that has not been disseminated globally is knowledge that does not exist. So they are completely free to plagiarize Go into your libraries and read all the beautiful material collected and analyzed by the African scholars. So long as this has not been packaged and made accessible to the global village, it does not exist. There is no copyright. Doctoral dissertations are carelessly listed all over the place. This is a major problem. We are doing harm to ourselves. And I think the whole idea is for us to begin the process. Look at any African scholar or many African scholars in the social sciences who, are, who purportedly have control over their own data and area geographically. He or she begins the book he's writing by quoting Western sources over material that he, ha he's, he holds a monopoly over. But in order to lend legitimacy to his own knowledge, he has to quote from a Western source because that is the normal expectation if he has to be promoted. It is this aspect of, you know, doing, ruining ourselves that I think is much more important. Within the African continent itself, how many publishers or how many university publishing agencies do we have? How many universities have a university press within Africa? We started a project, African Humanities Project on the continent, you know. And then we reached the point where we decided that the fellows who had benefited from the fellowship ought to start publishing using our own agency. So we needed to collaborate with any African university press. You know, it, it was tough outside South Africa, outside UNISA Press in South Africa and a few others. 
it was tough coming across any reliable publishing house in any African university which would leverage you know the, the intellectual capital that you that the university has to support a journal these are things that I think we ought to uh, talk about before even criticizing the West as having marginalized African scholarship for them. If I could just add to that, I, I agree. And I think one of the big things that needs to be part of this conversation is just what is the African sense of agency, right? So we'll often talk about lack of access, but what is the access that we have begun to create for ourselves? And I think in many ways, that's why this notion of looking at African epistemologies, that looking at African histories is very important, because then we will recognize that there's an extremely long intellectual tradition across the continent of disseminating knowledge in both formal and informal ways that we can go back to, again, not because we're going to do things exactly as they used to be in the past, but what were the things that worked that we can begin to carry with us into the future? And I think it's also important from a point of rep representation. When we think about STEAM, when we think about scholarship, when we think about what an academic looks like, do young people see people who look like this? Is this what comes to mind when they think of an academic as someone who's really shaping global discourse or is it someone else? And by recreating and representing what we've had in the past, I think people begin to see their possibilities very differently. Thank you very much uh, um, for this important question about uh, um, citations, uh, authoring. Uh, we are also part of the West. Uh, um, we, uh, we have to reclaim every space where the African is. We are part, Africa is part of the world, is of the world and in the world. So um, I, I take our examples here, right in this panel. Many of us have studied in the West. We are working in the West. I teach in uh, an American institution. My responsibility as an African working in the West is to claim the fact that, yes, I have been an African who is carrying African indigenous knowledge and is putting it in dialogue with other knowledges that I'm encountering in the West. So. The West is a product also of Africa because African civilization have contributed to what the West is. So I'm claiming that West. West I'm claiming that West. And I'm, I'm, I'm say, what I'm saying is that it's only when, as Professor Yanka argued that, if other world, the West legitimize a knowledge, without giving a credit. That's why I started with the question of Morenga or the question of, uh, of bitter leaf. These are knowledge systems within Africa, but today, if we go into Western pharmaceutical companies, they have appropriated, commodified, patented an African indigenous plant without giving credit to the other people who contributed to the knowledge that is being marketed. So we are in the West. We are the West. We are in Asia. We are Asian. Af they are Af African Afro-Asians. So for me, it's the, the new libraries, the new education, how we claim ourselves and how we enter into dialogue about uh, altering, legitimizing, and, and uh, ensuring that, as uh, Professor Yanka said, African libraries are claiming their presence everywhere in the world so that it can create the self-confidence in African child, the young person, to see that this is also a world f from which my my, 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 my Africans have contributed. It's, it's no longer a mat that is frightening to a young person. It's because the mat is in the art that they love, right? 
uh, the math is in the digital world that we contributed to. Um, so the digitization uh, is about fractals too. And Africa has contributed to that, right? So that's the conversation we're having. And African women have contributed to that knowledge system. So that uh, there is a place for an African woman. There is a citation of African. How many African women are cited? African women, whether they're from the continent or in the diaspora, wherever that diaspora is. How many African women get cited as a scientific minds? This is the question that some of us who are doing gender studies across the fields, when we sit, we check how many African women who are chemists, how many African women who are mathematicians, how many African women who are botanists, forget about African women healers, whose knowledge have been appropriated and codified because they speak African languages. Today, when we go everywhere, people are saying China, China. China brings its language. Everywhere you will have Confucius Institute. It's the past that is asserting itself in creating the confidence in China everywhere in the world. Everywhere in every campus, whether it's in America or in Africa or in, in Europe. When China comes, it brings Confucius Center. That is to, to say the past is the present and the future. Mm. Thank you. So Let uh, me yeah. just add a footnote on, on, on language that have you ever thought of any intelligent <laughs> quote unquote thesis in Yoruba? No. Have you ever thought of any intelligent quote unquote thesis in Akan or Ashanti? No. By the very nature of the meta language that has been used, it can be predetermined that it doesn't contain anything useful. But translate the same content from Yoruba into English or French, hooray, the very reversal of the meta, meta discourse magically transform that knowledge into something intelligent that can be used by the rest of the world. The issue of language is a major, major, major factor. And look at the place of Ghanaian language departments or African language departments in Africa. They are denigrated. They are not denigrated because it is a kind of linguistic determinism. It has been predetermined by the very medium through which knowledge has been clothed and transmitted. So the knowledge in, to them, the medium, it's much more important than the content. Okay, so uh, on that note, because we want to have, have time for a q and A, I I really want to bring, bring Kone into this conversation. Um, and so I think that all of us work in higher education because we all like being told that we're wrong by people that are younger than us, right? Um, and I think that there's a way in which the kind of the fastest way to prove that you're irrelevant is to be annoyed by young people, right? As opposed to really taking their ideas and, and their thoughts as, as wisdom. So Kone, so for you and for your classmates, um, what are some of the ideas that we've been talking about here that you think that we need to carry forward? And, and are there any ideas that you think that we need to, to discard? And I'll give you kind of an example. So for my generation who many of us saw our parents working super long jobs all of the time, we say, oh, you know, so now, you know, I'm a millennial. I don't think that I want to have that work schedule, right? I have value in other places, and I want to take the work ethic, and I want to take these ideas, but I want to build up my life in my own new way, as an example. So tell us what we're all getting wrong. I think that first, to valorize the culture African culture, we should try to introduce it in the system occidental. Parce que nombreux parmi nous se disent qu'ils sont africains, mais ne connaissent, ne connaissent pas leur culture. Il faut que l'Africain voie, connaisse son identité avant de pouvoir être... Quand on prend l'exemple de la période précoloniale, nos parents qui se sont battus pour 
obtenir leur, leur, leur indépendance. Ils avaient cette fierté. Or, nous, de nos jours, on n'a pas ça parce qu'on est, est dénaturalisé. On ne voit pas l'importance de la culture africaine. Donc, ce serait bien d'introduire ça dans le système occidental par des journées culturelles de, de différents... De, il y a différentes cultures africaines comme le Sénoufo, le Malinké, le Yoruba, pour qu'on se sente vraiment africain, qu'on se sente vraiment important et qu'on utilise ça, qu'on utilise, qu utilise cette fierté pour pouvoir travailler, vouloir valoriser notre pays. Je pense que si on avait cette culture africaine ancrée dans nous comme nos parents, cela pourrait nous aider à développer développer l'Afrique. Et aussi, en plus d'introduire la culture africaine, on devra aussi hum, développer très tôt l'esprit de leadership, puis d'entrepreneuriat, surtout au niveau des filles. Parce que la fille, depuis sa naissance, elle se met en tête qu'elle est faible, elle, elle n'a pas assez de connaissances. C'est pour ça qu'on est faible tôt dans les séries scientifiques. Si ce leadership est développé chez les filles comme chez les garçons, très tôt, on pourra être autonome et je pense que d'ici quelques décennies, l'Afrique pourra être un atout essentiel pour la construction de ce nouveau monde. Je vous remercie. Okay, so I think that we're going to open up to questions from uh, the floor, please. Um, I would love to get as, as many questions as uh, possible, so if they could be brief, that would be wonderful, please. Okay, this gentleman back there first. Uh, it's a, to the question of language, um, it's sort of a question and comment. When I ask a, a little exercise, in what language do we think as we're here? Mostly, in what language do we think? English, French, Portuguese? What does that mean? So, the, the ontological basis of, of epistemology is key. What we tell ourselves, who we are, and what we have come to believe. When we say we are African, what is this? Are we still reacting to the joke of Otto von Bismarck in 1885, where we were just partitioned into what we have become? Are we looking at taking something from the various cultural diversities and really putting it together into what we call African today? Or we are looking at what was before the colonial era? There are, there are questions that, for me, mean a lot. And if we want to go further, we have to believe in ourselves. We have to actually, and fortunately, Prof, there's actually somebody did a PhD in, uh, in, in Akan. Just last year, it was published. A whole PhD was done in indigenous language. And I've also heard the same for Swahili. So a whole, a whole, the whole work was, was, was in, in the local language. And she graduated in Ghana last year with a PhD. So these are models we can begin to look at. And begin um, this whole alienation from our very selves. Because we are taught to denigrate ourselves, to alienate ourselves from ourselves. And until we look at that, we may not be going anywhere. So we have to start from the early years. Yes, this is higher education and all of that. But uh, I mean, this is linguistics. It starts from the beginning. What do we teach our children? How do we speak to them? What do we use to, what, what language do we talk to them? I mean, I have, there are cases of nouveau rich mentality, people who went to school, tried and managed, and they've become wealthy. Suddenly, they don't want to talk to their children in any of the indigenous languages. Even the English they speak, or the, I mean, it's not the, the proper English. 
So what are you teaching your children? Then by the time we are done with college, we cannot even communicate with our grandmothers in any of our indigenous languages. So how do you solve their problems for them? So these are questions I'm just putting up and for us to really reflect on. Unfortunately, uh, I, I, I have just been having a lot of questions. Of course, uh, my orientation is philosophy and we don't necessarily have to have the answers. It's important that we keep thinking about these questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Chinwei, do you want to respond? Yeah, just, uh, really briefly, two days ago we had a side session with Professor Clay and he said something that um, stuck. He said if you don't know the direction you're going, any road looks attractive and, and you end up wandering in circles. So, and then you talked about the role of agency. There, there has to be a deliberate attempt to define our epistemology as it evolves. What we keep, what we discard. There's several things that we need to discard. Gender dynamics, certain traditional practices that served us well 100 years ago, but no longer serve us. So it really is a deliberate, intentional process of constantly defining who we are, how we raise our children, how we resolve conflicts, how we govern, all of those things create the, the theory of knowledge of who we are as a people. So it's not something that just magically happens. That's what I wanted to do. Okay. Thank you. And uh, next question, please. Right. Uh, my question, and also question come comment, is that uh, the language question is a very noted one, and a, a fairly difficult one, because I do recall in my studies of... Uh, African linguistics from the past, you know, at the AU, for instance, or AU at the time, there was a talk in the 80s of using uh, Swahili as the African continent's language. But then there was very great opposition from West Africa, actually, and I'm speaking as an East African from Kenya, you know, Swahili speakers. So, so which language shall we agree on as a continent? Because even though Swahili is the official language of the AU alongside Portuguese and French and English. I think there's a level at which when we get, and I'm happy we have a minister in the house, at the level at which, uh, you know, sovereign government level decisions on language, we quickly say, no, look, we are Aragan or Yoruba or, uh, or Zulu. And, uh, you know, Swahili, you know, wait a moment. Uh, and, and, and so that becomes a challenge. Related to that, I would like to then perhaps comment on that. Related to that, to that is, you know, we have appropriated English, French, and so forth. I think, in my opinion, we might actually as well say, look, we have Africanized this language. You know, the way we, I speak English is not really the way a guy from London or uh, Minneapolis will uh, speak the same language. So is it a case that we actually English, French, Portuguese have actually become African languages so that we don't rail against them too much? Um, and I say this because even though people like Professor Ngugi Wadhyomo have actually taken up writing Kikuyu, an indigenous language, they, have, they, they really you know, come to argue on the language question in English. With English you know, so, so the Africanization of English, French, and so forth might be worth considering. With regards to matters philosophy, I will be up, I'll appreciate perhaps a comment, because you've talked about Ubuntu, and again, there's been resistance to the concept of Ubuntu in intellectual circles because it is a Bantu philosophy from, you know, you know two, which is, uh, two, which is Mutu. And, and the other languages don't have that. So um, how do we resolve that? You know, the, the, the idea that uh, once you say Ubuntu, the, the mere mention of the word Ubuntu kind of says it is from a certain region, you know, southern and eastern Africa rather than the rest. How about concepts, philosophies that we've discussed in the past, including Pan-Africanism, African Renaissance, and, and, and Necritude. Thank you. It's, it's a very a very big, um, the issue of language is a very big one. Um, you know, one can begin with individual countries and the way that the respective countries, respective countries are dealing with the issue of language. But it gets more and more complicated and entangled when you even come to the issue of medium of instruction in the lower primary schools, which has been a very topical issue. There is so much 
emotionalism that is triggered when the issue of ca- language comes up um, in respect of what parents, with all the mindset, uh, what they expect uh, education, the education system to do, the issue of language, media of instruction in, within Ghana, for example, has been vacillating all over these years. Swing from, from English to Ghanaian language, English to Ghanaian language, right from independence, to a point where at the moment it is not even clear uh, which of the policies um, is being adopted and whether there is any political will, and I'm talking across countries, to really implement to the letter a decision that, for example, the Ghanaian language ought to be used as a medium of instruction in the lower uh, primary school. The way parents react to this, sometimes with, with, with violence, is what I'm worried about. So the moment you, you suggest that, well, it has been determined as a policy that Akan or Asante or the Ghanaian language of the environment in which the school is situated, is what uh, the dominant language is what is going to be used instead of English. Um, I remember a few years ago, one education minister was virtually demonized by parents. Um, the suggestion that it ought to be the indigenous language. The moment you mention that, it looks like, what are you talking about? Are you not in the global village where the reality is the reality? That, and I think one day you mentioned Ghanaian language or Nigerian language. They mistake you to mean that you are saying to the exclusion of everything else. And that is where the mistake comes in, that they are not thinking of the possibility of coordinate, coordinate bilingualism, where hand in hand between English and the local language, you know, you can train the child um, to do the right thing, to understand the concepts in the original language in which he was born on the local environment of the parents. And as you progress to the upper primary, you switch then uh, into English. So I think we want to maintain that balance that we are not saying to the exclusion of every other modern language or Western language, but how to ensure that knowledge of the cognitive system of the child at a very, very early age is not disturbed. Uh, one is recognizing concepts at a very, very early age. Uh, for those who are not aware, there are over 2,000 languages across the continent. So that opens up a whole another discussion of the politics of language and the hegemony of language. So I think we need to put that in context. And as you said, Madam, we are part of the world. We have evolved and we should be looking at, and you said that too, we, we, you should be looking at where we are today, how we've evolved and how we articulate who we are. So the concept of Ubuntu is expressed in a South African language, but it's an, a concept that finds expression across the continent. And something else you said, Madam, is that just because something is Western doesn't mean it's not African. I think that's really important. We have influenced Western thought in so many ways that we don't even realize. So because something has manifested and has been articulated and codified and documented in Western um, philosophy doesn't mean we immediately dissociate ourselves. And I'll give an example. Um, the educational philosopher uh, Abraham Maslow Many of us know the pyramid, uh, Maslow's pyramid, that starts with the basic clothing and feeding and emotion, self-esteem, and then the tip of the pyramid is self-actualization. That is a very European version of Maslow that stuck within the North America and Europe. However, the same philosopher Maslow had revised his pyramid several years later, was never taken up within Western thought, the tip of the pyramid now, the revised pyramid, is self-transcendence. I truly believe that, that that's an African influence to that philosophy. Self-transcendence is the same as Ubuntu. It is essentially saying that you don't 
arrive, you don't succeed when you have actualized yourself. You only have succeeded when you go back to the bottom of the pyramid and bring as many up as you can. That's when you've truly achieved um, self-awareness and self-excellence. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to come back again to the question of language. Uh, the question that our colleague uh, from East Africa and the panelists and minister is responding. By the way, we have two linguists on the panel, so <laughs> you can see. <laughs> so when we talk about language, uh, the emotional tension, to me, I look at it as uh, the consequences of the trauma that the Africans have experienced. And that as have experienced through enslavement and colonialism, and that we still have to exercise. Today, when we talk about Americanism, Coca-Cola, everywhere you go, you have Coca-Cola. You go deep in looking into Coca-Cola, you will know that the African is in the Coca-Cola. That to me is language and cognition. The language I'm talking about here is uh, beyond just the form, African languages, Yoruba, Akan, uh, which are very fundamental. I come from a Francophone country. Let me go back, maybe in the East Africa or the Anglophone countries in Ghana.